Namaskara and welcome to BIC Talks, a podcast brought to you by Bangalore International Center, where we present conversations that move, inform, and encourage discourse. If you care for the nation, don't care, that's a different issue. Hmm. <laughs> but if you care for the nation, you should be willing to debate this because we're talking about accelerating growth. But to accelerate growth, first you have to see what are we not getting right. If you say everything is fine in this perfect world, and we're the best nation in the world, we're guru to the world, we're, everybody respects us, we have nothing to learn, we don't have place to start the conversation. We have met audiences who believe this, who actually don't want to hear that we have 35% malnutrition. They don't accept that as a number. If we don't even accept the basic facts, we can't have a conversation. And one of the things we're trying to say is you don't have to necessarily dismiss the other side, engage with the idea, and then we can have a proper conversation. You can tell me you're all wrong. We have to go back to the old system. We have to look like China. We will grow strongly. Fine, we can have a debate. But let's accept some basic facts in having that debate. You just heard Dr. Raghuram Rajan, economist, educator, and former governor, Reserve Bank of India, speaking in context of his latest book. Breaking the Mold, Reimagining India's Economic Future is a first-time collaboration between Dr. Rajan and economist and educator Dr. Rohit Lamba. These two distinguished voices from the field of economics and public policy have put together a gripping book about the future of India's economic development. They argue that there is a truly Indian path to prosperity that builds on the strengths of our people and our political and societal frameworks. They examine fundamental policy choices that concern every Indian. In this episode of BIC Talks, Dr. Rajan speaks, followed by a conversation with Dr. Lamba and Professor Manaswini Bhalla, Associate Professor of Economics, Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, tackling questions like where is India going today? Is it surging forward, having just overtaken the United Kingdom to become the fifth largest economy in the world? Or is it floundering, unable to provide jobs for the millions joining the labor force? What should India do to secure a better future? This episode tackles these critical questions that revolve around India's growth and progress in the 21st century. And now, over to Dr. Rajan. Thanks. Uh, Thanks very much for having me. What I'm going to do in the next few minutes is just set out the basic framework, why we wrote this book and what are the basic themes. And then together with Rohit, we will have a discussion and explore it in more detail. Okay, we start with, you know, a couple of questions. And let me just put one of them on the table. Is India flourishing just having overtaken the United Kingdom as the fifth largest economy in the world? You know, you've seen the latest GDP numbers, 7.5% growth in the last couple of quarters. Or is India flailing, unable to employ the teeming millions who are entering the labor force with labor force participation really low amongst men and abysmal amongst women, in fact, the lowest in the G20? So are we doing really well? Are we doing really poorly? The answer is what we try and get at at this book. And the answer is, you know, we're doing reasonably well, but there's much room for improvement. And we absolutely need that improvement if we want to grow rich before we grow old. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, our prime minister just put down on the table, we want C2047 as Amrit Kal. You know, translation of what that means, I think, is we want to be a developed country by then. Just put some numbers on the table to understand that. We are in 2023. That's 24 years from now to 2047. Amrit Kal. Let's assume we grow 6% a year, which is about our growth potential right now, for the next 24 years. And that's an extraordinary feat. Very few countries grow at that pace for such a sustained period of time after having grown at 6% a year for the previous so many years. But... I'm adding another caveat, that we don't grow our population. And that obviously is wrong, but I just want you to do the math with this. We don't grow our population, we grow 6% a year, so all our GDP output goes into per capita income, makes every individual richer. 
If you grow at 6% for 12 years, that's the rule of 72, you double your income. Grow at 6% for another 12 years, you double it once more. So in 2047, we will have four times the income we have today. Today, our per capita GDP is 2,500. Multiply it four times, we become $10,000 per capita. That's below where China is today. It puts us in the ranks of the middle, middle income, nowhere near rich. And by 2047, we are running out of the population dividend that we talked about for a long time. Hopefully, some of our less developed states will become more developed. Already, states in the South are below their reproduction rate. And as a result, India will start aging rapidly. So India will become old before it becomes rich at current pace. Okay. That's, of course, longer term. In the short run, we really have to figure out how we employ all those people who are entering the labor force, our demographic dividend. According to CMIA, our unemployment numbers are 10%. You know, our labor employment numbers are terrible. We don't have good data, but CMI is the best we have, along with probably the periodic labor force survey. And the point is, when you see the hunger for jobs, as demonstrated in the recent election, as demonstrated in conflicts, say in Manipur, it's about reservations, amongst other things. When you see the hunger for jobs, it suggests that the cup is half empty. The cup is, of course, half full because we are growing at the fastest pace of any G20 economy. But of course, we're also the poorest G20 economy and likely to grow faster than the others. So if we want to grow faster, if we want to create those jobs, if we want to make our youth less frustrated, so much so that they have to go and protest in parliament. What do we do? What do we have to do? What's the path forward? And one answer is, let's double down on the old way of growth. Look at China. They grew really fast. When they were at our level of per capita GDP, they really took off. They went into double digit growth every year. They were the manufacturing workshop to the world. And so let's go the manufacturing route. Let's start with assembly, move up the value scale. We will get there eventually, just like China did. But of course, China had a little bit of help. Relative to India, for example, it was at a high level of education. We don't talk much about that, but that was a big difference in China, how, why it did better, because workers were more capable and skilled, even at the beginning of the liberalization. But China had other things going for it, right? One, which again, we don't talk about, is China was much more decentralized in terms of its policies for industry. So every locality determined the kinds of policies that would benefit its businesses and therefore created local champions. China had cronyism, but it was about creating local champions. Shanghai had its own car factory, the GM car factory. All taxis in Shanghai had to be from that factory. They helped out their own and as those local champions grew, they went into competition with other local champions. China had competitive cronyism, which generated substantial growth because the local party boss was rewarded on the growth of the local municipality or locality. And that generated huge Chinese growth because policies were tailored for the manufacturing establishments in the area. So China had two things which are different from India, better educated population and much more cronyism, which at the local level, it wasn't national level cronyism, but local cronyism, which helped growth. The third element China had, which we don't have, is it had a, effectively a dictatorship. You know, this rule of the party and rule by, of the party's boss over everybody else. And what that did was it helped China. It didn't have democratic niceties in acquiring land. You know, we have trouble building that high-speed rail between Mumbai and Ahmedabad. They built out 30,000 kilometers of high-speed rail within a few years because they don't have a problem acquiring land. They just run roughshod. The labor unions, virtually non-existent because they're all creatures of the party. And as a result, they do what the party tells them. The party for a long time told them, don't increase wage demands too much. Keep wages below productivity growth because that gives us really profitable enterprises that can grow fast. And the quid pro quo for having wages below productivity is you created many more jobs. And over time, wages grew because productivity grew very fast. So that was another benefit. Third was, we are going to pay our savers very low returns. We're going to pay them low returns because therefore we can subsidize industry with cheap capital. 
And cheap capital is going to be yet another way we create profitability. So China did a bunch of things. One of the things that helped it do all this was the lack of democracy. So you hear in the corridors of power, we need to go back to manufacturing. And the way to go back to manufacturing is become more authoritarian. Let's, let's not have democratic niceties. We will grow faster as a result. That is one alternative. There's another alternative, which is to recognize the world has moved on. Technology has moved on. That in fact, when you look at global production today, we have what is called a smile curve. Think about Apple producing iPhones. Think of the x-axis. Think of the x-axis as being stages of the production process. And think of the y-axis as being value added. When you think of a product like the iPhone, the early parts, R&D, design, patents, that's where a lot of value is added to the production process. That creativity that Steve Jobs had, which created that iPhone that we all love, that was part of what made the iPhone valuable. The patents to even the design of the iPhone is held by Apple. That's in California. And as Rohit keeps saying, when you look at the Apple phone, it says designed in California. It's not made in California. Because the last time Apple made anything was 2004. Since then, it has outsourced all production to Foxconn. So as you go along the production chain, global production chain, you get to manufacturing. But manufacturing is really competitive because you've got you know, Chinese workers competing with Vietnamese workers, with Bangladeshi workers, with Indian workers. The rents from manufacturing have all dissipated. You're no longer competing as a Chinese did with the Americans and therefore have a lot of profitability because you're doing labor arbitrage, Chinese labor, much cheaper than American labor. Today, you're competing with Vietnamese workers who have better machines, with Chinese workers who have good machines, great logistics. That's why it's hard for India to compete at the lowest commodity end of manufacturing. Now, you go further, you go beyond commodity manufacturing into the proximate stages to the consumer, marketing. Finance. Think of the Apple Store. That's, that's the final sales point, plush place, lots of value added in getting customers to come there. Think of the iTunes. Think of the App Store. These are all places Apple makes money again. What does Apple own? It owns the intellectual property, it owns the content and everything on the plateau in between. What it doesn't own is the valley, which is where manufacturing takes place. Apple is worth $3 trillion on a good day, $3 trillion. Foxconn is worth $50 billion on a good day. Apple was worth 60 times Foxconn. In other words, what is the part of the supply chain worth capturing? It's the plateaus, not the valley, okay? Interestingly, India has lost out on commodity manufacturing. Very few places we're good at commodity manufacturing. Where we're good in manufacturing is really in Jugaad manufacturing, where we actually put a little more value added. Think, for example, of our generic pharmaceuticals where we for a long time discovered better ways to actually make it in a cheaper way. That was the engineering that went into it. Think, for example, about our two-wheeler industry. We sort of, in a sense, um, tailor those two-wheelers, certainly in our country, to the nature of the terrain in this country. There's incremental engineering which makes it more valuable and more, more relevant. And that's why we can sell our two-wheelers to the rest of Africa and sometimes East Asia. Where we're not competitive is on the commodity manufacturing. Where we are already, where we have a presence, is on services which we provide to the rest of the world. We all know this is the IT capital of India, and we certainly started with IT services. But we move from there. Today, we see a number of companies, consulting companies, coming to hire consultants from India. Why? Because this is where the labor arbitrage is now. A consultant in the US, fresh out of school, is paid $200,000. A consultant fresh from an MBA at the prestigious Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, will probably earn forty dollars to $50,000, forced one. And today, that consultant from Bangalore can present to the client in the United States because Zoom started working during the pandemic and it became okay to offer services at a distance. We will see an explosion of this. We're already seeing it happen. But we're also seeing not just direct services, we're seeing services embedded in supply chains, right? 
Think of the global capability centers that are emerging across India. There's a lot written about it. 1,600 of them, 40% of the global total are in India. Goldman Sachs' biggest office outside of the United States, 8,000 people in India. And these are people not just doing coding, but they're building exchanges, they're building risk management systems. Some of them are even trading. So you are moving to the front office from the back office. And interestingly, in an article in the Times of India, I think the day before yesterday, they talked about Indian CXOs emerging from these GCCs. That is, you're actually looking after a whole set of activities across the world for the multinationals. Now, these are, you know, whether it's services or services embedded in a supply chain or manufacturing related services. For example, the Tesla, 40 million lines of code, a lot of that code written by programmers situated across the world, many here. And so those are examples where actually the nature of exports has changed. And earlier it was very hard to capture you know, value added from services. The typical service was a haircut. How do you offer a haircut in San Francisco from here? And how do you even scale it up? Can you haircut five people at the same time? You can't. But today you can embed that code in a Tesla, which is sold across the world. And as a result, you can basically export services, whether directly or embedded in, in manufacturing products. So this offers a huge opportunity for India. But of course, the biggest opportunity is in capturing where Apple is, the high value. And that implies creating the intellectual property, as Sharad from iSpirit keeps saying, we need to create products. And we are absolutely with him. In fact, this is his idea, which we are taking forward. We do need to create products. And products need the creation of intellectual property. Where is India's TikTok? Where is India's Apple? Where, after 30 years of a reasonably successful auto industry, do we have even one single Indian car which is sold across the world? We don't. We need to have them. That has to be the next phase of Indian growth, capturing the plateaus and not focusing on capturing the valley. The valley is not where the value is. So then the question comes, well, why not manufacturing? Because we've got to create jobs. We haven't created jobs in manufacturing for the last 40 years. Our share of manufacturing as a share of total jobs has remained stagnant for the last 40 years. We have created jobs in manufacturing because there are more jobs, but the share hasn't changed. So as agriculture comes down, what is taking the residual? It's construction and it's services. And services has really grown. Now people say, oh, you know, you can't have IT people doing all the other jobs. No, it's not. These aren't just programmers. These are, you know, uh, your restaurant waiter. These are your retailers. One of the fastest jobs in growing jobs in India is security guard. These are all services. So services also can provide low skill jobs. They have been. But what we want in the longer run is to upskill all these jobs. And what we offer in the book is examples of how we can upskill these jobs, how we can actually make that transformation within a decade. And what is important to make the transformation that creates the intellectual property, that creates the potential consultants, is really focusing on three things. We start in the book by saying focus on governance reforms, because without governance reforms, nothing will happen. I'll give you an example of what we mean by governance reform in a second. The second thing we say is we need to focus on improving our human capital. You know, we can talk all we want about being a developed country. We're not, because really our education is not up to par. You've, many of you have read the ASA report. You know, read it again. Post-pandemic, it's worse than it was pre-pandemic. Fifth grade, 50% of the kids can't do math at the second grade level. 50% of the kids. That's a huge number. If you want those kids to be part of your developed world in 2047, they're going to be part of the labor force. 35% of our kids suffer from malnutrition. 35% of those kids will be stunted and unable to do work as normal workers in 2047. What are we talking about when we can't fix our basics? We need to start fixing the basics today. And that starts at the child level. We need much better child nutrition and, and education. 
And then moving up right through, we need to improve the quality of our educational institutions. We don't have one institution in the top 100 in the world, higher educational institutions. The one that flirts with it is right here, the Indian Institute of Science, set up by Jamshedji Tata. We have an interesting anecdote in the book about his dialogue with Swami Vivekananda. When they were talking, he was trying to persuade Swami Vivekananda that higher educational institutions were actually monasteries and would occupy you know, really intellectuals and they would add to the nation. I think he's as right today as he was right then. And we need the Vivekanandas in this country to say, that's the way to go. We need more intellectual contributions. We have to become a Vishwaguru by creating the patterns, creating the intellectual property that will make us world leaders. So we need that. So I, I talked about the fact we need governance reforms. Why do we need governance reforms? In part, to make these kinds of actions on education, on healthcare, to improve our human capital more possible. Let me give you a quick example of one kind of governance reform. Why is it that our politicians aren't focused on improving the quality of schools and healthcare, except in a few states, Kerala, Delhi, these are the few states where they focus. Delhi has been a big change with the Aam Aadmi Party. The quality of schools has improved considerably, so much so that, you know, according to some measures, the government schools do better than the private schools in Delhi. Mohalla clinics have been a big change in that first layer that many Delhi poor to middle class residents see because those clinics are free, accessible, the doctor is available, the pharmacist is available. Why aren't more states doing this instead of focusing on who can give more freebies? And I think part of the problem is we are an overly centralized country. You don't get credit within the lifetime of your government for educational reforms, for healthcare reforms, because you're too big a state. Nobody sees it happening and it's too diffused. In Delhi, which is really a municipality, you can see it tomorrow when you clean up your schools, clean up the toilets, repaint the school, and people see that there's a different place to come. So that is what we really have to worry about when we think about human capital. We have so many ideas on improving human capital, but let's start also by decentralizing governance so that people bottom up can say, we want better schools, we want better uh, healthcare, and see it come to them because they can address their political leaders more directly. As you can see, this is moving in the wrong direction from the centralization that we see happening in the country over the last few years. Let me give you a couple of examples of the kind of possibility. So the book is full of examples of what India can be. It's an optimistic book, right? Don't buy the commentary that we're negative. We're negative only in the sense that we say we have a far way to go. But we can reach there if we do the right things. And what is important is to figure out what those right things are. So I think the right things, governance reform, human capital reform, and lastly, this is something that Sharad from iSpirit has been pushing, but we need to push harder, is we need to create the conditions for a creative economy. An economy which creates the intellectual capital, the innovation which enables us to capture the heights. One of the most important factors in creativity and innovation is debate, is free speech, is openness. Again and again, if you look at the history of the world, that is, has been a big factor which also suggests we should resist the move towards authoritarianism, resist the move towards turning back the clock, resist the move towards trying to make us a China. That path is closed. And let me end by first saying why that path is closed, then give you a few examples. Why is that path closed? The West cannot tolerate another China at this point. We are 1.4 billion people. If we want to employ them all in manufacturing, we have to become as big as China in terms of its exports. The West has seen what China did to their manufacturing. Every country wants to have some manufacturing inside. It's going to be very resistant. You see, since the pandemic, certainly since the Trump tariffs on China, the amount of protectionist measures across the world is growing up exponentially. Free trade in goods is, to some extent, passé. Of course, it's not showing up in trade yet. But already, you see, American firms will not invest in China anymore. So, you're seeing that happen. So that's one reason, be like China, well, you can't be a second China. The world doesn't have room for two Chinas right now. Second is China's not going anywhere. It used to be 
that as you go through manufacturing, go to the higher levels of manufacturing, you vacate the lower levels of manufacturing, and that's where the new countries go. China's 1.4 billion people still has people in the Western provinces who haven't been employed out of agriculture, still has a reserve army that they can draw on. Wages in China have been going up, but they haven't been going up to the extent that you actually find Chinese workers less productivity adjusted costly than Indian workers. So essentially, China's going nowhere, and Vietnam, Bangladesh, they're all there. Again, going back to the earlier point, this is the most competitive part of the supply chain. It's not going to be easy getting jobs. Not that we're against it, but if you think you're going to subsidize your way to getting those jobs, think again, because you have to subsidize for a long, long time unless you become as competitive. If you say, we, to begin with, we don't, we're not competitive, we have to subsidize, well, think about how long you have to subsidize to get those jobs. So I want to summarize. What we're saying is think about an alternative. Services doesn't just mean you know, services like IT and consulting and telemedicine and all that has been made possible. It also means services focused on the domestic economy, which can be real job churners very quickly, improve education, improve healthcare. And there, there are a lot of moderately skilled jobs that can be created if we put our minds to it. But the benefit of that is we'll work on strengthening our human capital, which in the longer run will be our ticket to development. If we don't have well-educated people who are smart and creative, they're going to be toast for what's coming. And therefore, we need to get there faster. I mean, all the automation, robotics, chat, GPT, three, four, five, all speaks to the fact we need to move faster here, otherwise we'll get eaten. There are examples in the book, many examples. Let me end with three. Tilfi, this is your traditional handicrafts, Banarsi saris. How can we create a global market for it? Through services. What Tilfi does is does a website, does the financing. The problem with old Banarsi sari weavers was that they take, took the risk on the sari they wove. They owned it. And so they were very reluctant to move from the kinds of designs they already had. What happened as Tilfi said, look, Tilfi is a small firm, which is starting off trying to market Banarsi saris to the rest of the world. What Tilfi said is, we will take the risk. We will buy whatever you make. So that was number one. Gave them the ability to experiment a little more. Tilfi collaborated with designers to provide the designs that these weavers, traditional weavers could use. You got Banarsi saris, which were now much more attractive, not the old hackneyed design. The second thing, once you make these new designs, much harder to copy. So all the fakes that were emerging that you didn't know whether this weaver spent three months or three days on a fancy machine bought from China, it turned out that once you changed and once you branded it, it became much harder. Of course, there are many other ways of certifying today, but what this is saying is we can do a sea change in our handicrafts. Today, Stilfi is selling Banarsi saris across the world and expanding to other forms of handicrafts. That's a traditional activity, which is manufacturing, but augmented by website design, creativity, financing, and now becomes much bigger and expanded and sold around the world. So that's one example. Second example of intellectual property created in India, Agnikul. I don't know how many have heard of Agnikul. It's a guy who's working in AIG Finance and another friend. This guy always wanted to be an astronaut. Of course, dream escaped couldn't be an astronaut, said, okay, I want to be Elon Musk. Okay, want to be Elon Musk? Go back to India and, uh, you know, he, he sent a letter. He said he, he spam mailed a whole lot of professors saying, I want to build a rocket. One professor from IIT Madras responded and said, come, work. The guy went back and started designing a rocket with, you know, he had an engineering degree, but he had no aerospace degree or whatever. But this is the entrepreneurial zeal. Started designing rockets basically 30, 40, 50 feet rockets, meant to take small payloads. He's thinking moderate, still not Elon Musk, Jaiga rocket, but every part is 3D printed. So no part can be more than 40 centimeters on, on each side. It has to be 40 by 40, 40 by 40. But everything is 3D printers, motors, fuel lines, etc. So the chances of making mistakes are much lower the likelihood that the rocket will be essentially less error prone and you can send many more expensive satellites up is higher. 
These rockets are supposed to go up to 400 kilometers. They are testing rockets at this point. This is an example of Indian design, Indian intellectual property embedded in products, which actually require no assembly line. It's all assembled in 3D printers, which they've bought from abroad. So that's a second ago. Last example I want to end with, which is from your own town, Bangalore, and your own institution, I am Bangalore, the power of education, PC Mustafa, young man, well, he's still a young man today, but he started off, his father was a laborer on a farm. Laborer was collecting ginger root and putting it on the, uh, on the cart to be taken for sale. That was his job. Mustafa was a child, went to school, failed in sixth grade, you know, dropped out, came back home, started working on the farm. Kind teacher comes to the farm and says, hey, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm working on the farm. I failed. The teacher says, do you want to be that? Or you want to be like all the people in the town, the big cheeses with uh, good jobs and so on? And Mustafa had the, had the obvious answer. I'd like to be like them. So he says, come back, come to school. So Mustafa goes back to school, back to sixth grade, where all the kids are from the previous year, make fun of him. And so he's dejected. He goes back to his teacher and says, what do I do? And teacher says, do one thing well, that'll give you confidence. So Mustafa works on math and tops the class in math. And after that, it's a role. He tops the class overall, gets into NIT, does a degree in computer science, gets a job outside, and then comes back looking to set up an enterprise. Goes to I'm Bangalore, sees his cousin's shop where they're selling idli batter out of plastic uh, sachets and with the rubber band around it says, you know, you can do something more hygienic, something better. And he works for a year in designing batter that doesn't spoil quickly, batter that is hygienic, batter that stays inside the packet without spoiling. And then he starts selling it. And, you know, there's more on, on how he sells it. But eventually it becomes a success. ID Fresh Foods, now it sells everything from batter, coffee, and so on. This is a guy who, because of education, moved from being a worker, agricultural worker's son, to now actually being an employer of thousands. And he makes it a point to employ people like him, people who are in remote areas, who got an ability to move out of there and brings them to work in his. That's the power of education. That's what can happen if we put our minds to it. Mustafa now employs over 2,000 people. And I think we can do it. I think the challenges are there. But the first thing, if we recognize the challenges, we can make a huge difference. Well, thank you very much. I want to begin by thanking you, Professor Rajan. Besides all the you know, credentials and positions that you've held, one thing that probably we miss out is that you're a role model to a generation of youngsters in India, inspiring them to take economics and business as a career. So thank you for doing that. And None of my do. <laughs> so I wanted to begin with the following. You mentioned that India is growing fine at a respectable growth rate, but at the same time, there's a huge problem of unemployment. And uh, if I get it right, you mentioned that we have to grow at least at 8.5%, if not more, to manage the current and future employment requirements. And, and at the same time, you also mentioned that we should compete in ideas. And competing at ideas requires high-skilled labor. Somehow, your suggestion of competing at the extreme of the smile curve seems slightly counterintuitive to someone who's not read the book. And the reason being the following, that our labor force primarily is unskilled. Given the daunting problem of unemployment, as well as the fact that we are highly unskilled, could you please help us explain this dilemma? Uh, very quickly, and then I'll let Rohit Rohe have also, a chance yeah. to speak. We have to work on improving our human capital. That implies at every level. And, you know, one of the reasons many students who graduate don't have work is surveys suggest 50% of them, 50% of our college graduates are unemployable. In other words, they haven't learned enough to get a job that they're supposed to be qualified for. Civil engineers who don't know civil engineering. Yeah. And so we need to remedy a fair amount there. And that is part of the process of strengthening the education process right through. Hmm. And hopefully, at the end of the strengthening, if you put a kind of supply chain, you got to strengthen it at the beginning, reduce malnutrition, teach kids more before at the early stage, improve it at the middle, get better schools. Yeah. We have 
brought everybody into school, but we don't teach them well. Get better quality. We need to figure out how to do that. We talk about it various ways in the book. Get better colleges, but get better universities. We train the teachers that will teach in the colleges all along. But that last part, get better universities, is going to be where the intellectual property can be created if we get them. Now, sometime we can address the issue of money. Where's the money going to come from? We'll, yeah. we'll come to that. But the point is, we need improvements across the board. And they will address every part of the employment problem in the sense that if you get more trained workers, we'll have companies coming to India to look for those workers. The reason we don't have so many is because they say, we just can't find, we hear this refrain again and again from entrepreneurs, we can't find the skilled workers we need. Your colleague at Chicago, Luigi, in your conversation over the book, in that podcast, he mentioned something very interesting that caught my attention. He says that, you know, India's problem with respect to U.S. is rather simple. All that India probably needs to do is reallocate more resources into education sector, because given the reputation and recognition associated with education, everything else will follow. So do you think that the solution is creating more IITs, more IAMs? Is the problem that simple? It's not. I don't want to minimize the nature of the problem, right? It's not also just a problem of funding because, you know, you can throw more funding, employ more teachers, but if they don't come to school to teach, it's not valuable. Or if they have big classes where they can't follow individual students. Yeah. It, we need a transformation in this yeah. process. But the first thing we need is political leaders to pay attention to the problem. Yeah. If they don't pay attention to the problem, you're not going to fix it in the first place. So I'll come to that in a while. Do you want to add something to Yeah, I mean, in terms of the question you asked, I think it is a rather complicated, I think also counterintuitive question that you asked. And I think it took us a while to kind of wrap mm. our head around it about what is it that you know, India should do and so on. I think we broadly reached the conclusion that that just because nobody has done it doesn't mean that you can't do it. And I think if you read a famous book from, you know, a person from your city, Ram Guha, India after Gandhi, you know, it's kind of eye-opening when, you know, at least when I read it for the first time, where repeatedly, for example, I'm talking about the political domain, the world didn't give India a chance in terms of being a democracy. Hmm. Kind of repeats that fact over and over again in his book. That why? Because India is the only poor and consistent democracy in the world for a country of its size. No other country was consistently democratic at the per capita level of incomes that India was. And I think broadly what we are saying is that it is a poverty of intellect and ambition to just follow the path that has already been followed. Hmm. And obviously it's not easy. Hmm. And I think a lot of the ingredients that will go into creating that path are sort of actually independent of services manufacturing in this debate. Yeah. That's what I think Raghu is trying to emphasize with education, right? Hmm. You're just basically trying to create a basic workforce Coming to your, you know, the, the dilemma part is that what we are saying is that this should not be your best case aspiration for the country hmm. that we should start here in the valley, as Raghu was saying, and hmm. then move up, especially because you've had a head start at the two ends of the valley, and especially because your political societal ingredients are kind of tailored to being better at the two ends of the valley than the middle, plateaus than the middle. And finally, what I think is slightly underappreciated in this discussion is that, I mean, it's obviously an audacious ask, and we're not trying to minimize. Hmm. If you're actually able to do it, you can then also dictate where the lower end goes. Does it stay in India? Does it go to which state in India? Yeah. Once you actually own the intellectual property, you could be the one sending manufacturing to Bangladesh or Vietnam and so on, if you actually think in, in those dimensions. Jobs, there is very good research. So that's one reason why mm. jobs will stay in India, mm. even in, in the manufacturing mm. sector. There's also very good recent research that shows for every high skill job, for example, you know, a lot of people sitting here that you create in India, four to five low skill jobs of decent quality get yeah. added. So the externality effects are not small. The multiplier yeah. effects are not small. Both of you mentioned the importance of the state in pushing forward the public good. Yeah, and you know, economists from the break of the dawn have been, I mean, be it Amartya Sen or be it anybody, have been trying to say that invest more in public good, healthcare or education sector, invest more. But somehow the government or be it, be it any party at power, somehow it's a hard sell to them. Both of you had have an experience of working with and as a policymaker. So my question is that how does one prevent a policymaker from getting tempted with these short-term you know, goals, but rather invest in these long-term, invest in more in public goods? What is anything new we bring to it to Amartya Sen's constant demand for better public goods for investing in capabilities? Mm -hmm. We think 
you need governance reform also to make it happen. You can't keep saying this is important. It is important, but it takes 10 years to show up. I won't do it. Yeah. If it's important, but I, my constituencies can see the results very quickly, and my constituencies are going to hammer my, on my door if I don't do something about it. And that's why we keep saying decentralization yeah. is an important element of the answer. If you look at the states which are doing much better on education, they typically are states that have decentralized much more. A classic recent example being Delhi. And, and so again and again, we say it has to be a whole of country approach. Hmm. And yeah, you might say, oh, how are you going to get the country to decentralize? Hmm. Well, we hope that once we put all these ideas together, then parties can start thinking about platforms, which put together these, these ideas in a bigger whole. I think part of the problem is what, what uh, Rohit just mentioned, the poverty of imagination. We can't think of how to move forward beyond the Ravity debate. How can we actually do something which kickstarts us? And Gurcharan Das's point, India sort of uh, works at night or India grows at night, I think still holds because government doesn't really do what is necessary to support. But going forward, it has to. Otherwise, we will not be compared in the global economy. And therefore, you need a different form of governance. You need a different form of government. And you need, you know, obviously, private sector to kick in in this process. You wanted to add something? Because the, the connection between decentralization and creativity may not be very natural. I think, yeah, I think the, the different ends of the, of the vision in some sense. I think to your question about the, the goods, uh, the public goods, I think there is kind of a broken link between the, you know, the, the people who can provide it and the people who are demanding it. And I think mm. to, to, to make that link is really our responsibility. Exactly. By our, I mean the media, the intellectuals, the people who kind of have to relentlessly pursue this. What's the broken link? So, so the way we think about it is that, you know, there is a demand, right? You, look, you looked at the, pro, you, all of you looked at the protests when the army introduced the Agni V, right? Like how, how much it affects people's lives when we just slightly change mm. uh, hiring norms in government jobs. There is, you know, there is, there is a simmering demand. You know, you travel anywhere in India, you see people talk about jobs. And so what you're saying is that, well, if this is true, then why are we not seeing a response? Because we are, a, if anything, a very, very hotly contested electoral democracy. And I think the, both sides of the spectrum are a little bit caught in, uh, they've become a prisoners of their own instruments. Yeah. And the instruments are broadly reservations and government jobs. And what you know, Raghu just mentioned is what is now being mentioned as freebies. And as I said, I think it is our responsibility because the demand exists. The demand is a bit diffused. It becomes concrete in, 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 in sporadic ways when you see these protests, but it's not consistent enough. And for it to be consistent enough, we need better debate and better political entrepreneurship. So any, no, but yeah. let, let me just add to that. I mean, the point about decentralization is not about creativity. It's about creating the public goods. Why would politicians respond? They will respond if they can be turfed out. That's one. Yeah. That's where we have elections. But they'll also respond when they can get the benefits of responding quickly. Yeah. Today, if somebody in Lucknow wants to change the educational system through that gigantic bureaucracy, what comes out at the end will come out 10, 15 years from now and will be a caricature of what they started with, even if they are the most well-meaning education minister in the state, accompanied by the well-meaning bureaucrat from the IAS. How you make this actually work is get much more, much less of a distance between the people who are getting the benefits and the people who are providing the benefits. That's the decentralization point. If today I'm in a district and I have supreme control over educational spending, I can possibly see some effects by spending in the right way. But also the district people know who to blame mm -hmm. if the schools aren't performing. They know who to contact if the teacher doesn't show up. They don't have to go to Lucknow. They just go to the local district headquarters. And, you know, think about decentralization even further to the panchayat. If you decentralize the primary schools. To, the point is decentralization of funds, functions, and functionaries. We've talked about it a long time. It's not happening. We're growing bigger as a country and less able to provide the public goods. If we decentralize more, there will be a holding of the authorities' feet to the fire. And that will be a good thing. We will get more of it. So if I, if I read it correctly, you're saying empower uh, panchayats, empower people on the ground. And that brings me to a question that's on my mind. When I read the book and I thought, you know, you can put lots of checks and balances 
to ensure that the government gets and ends up doing what you want. But somehow I felt that the real challenge in the society is not that. It is the fact that we have probably we have lack of intent to uphold certain values like inclusivity and transparency. And, you know, somehow government is just a reflection of the society that it elects. So um, no matter how many checks and balances we put in place, without this intent to uphold those values, do you think that it will be hard to change the conversation around public goods or anything for that? matter? Basically, what I'm trying to ask is any suggestions that are recommendations that you may have for the society and the culture at large. <laughs> if you pose the problem the way you're posing it, almost always the answer is nothing can be done. Yeah. <laughs> we are messed up as a society, we cannot change. But very few societies are so messed up they cannot change. Hmm. And as the need arises, I mean, think about education. I mean, uh, we write about it. Myron Wiener used to say the reason India doesn't focus on universal education, which is a travesty as a democracy, you don't want universal education, is because of the caste system. Hmm. We have a caste system where the higher caste don't want the lower caste to get educated because it will make them uppity and make them, in a, in a sense, want better things. While what we need them for is agricultural labor, right? There are many people who've written about this in other countries, but he was making the point for India. If that remained true, we would not have what? even the kind of education system we have today. What changed? Well, change, one change was demand. We liberalized, there was now a demand for more workers outside of agriculture. And so there was a need for education and we started to improve. If you look at liberalization and you look at the number of years of education, they are strongly correlated. We started educating more. Now, there are other correlations. We saw the emergence of middle and lower caste governments, which also in some ways pushed education. So, I mean, things change. And we have to somehow believe, if we are to improve as a society, that the arc is always towards progress. Mm. And part of what we're doing with this book is to set, you know, some additional ideas out there so that we can debate this. And that's why we're talking to the smart people in this room with the hope that many of you carry this, some of what we're, you may not agree with everything we're saying, but let's start the debate. All right, so we you know sitting now that we're here in Bangalore, the hub of uh, innovation and services, um, I wanted to you know, pivot the discussion towards entrepreneurship and creativity. And you, you talk about the role of government that's needed. We talked about regulatory in systems. We also talked about education system becoming better so that we can you know, m uh, ensure people think outside the box. What are your recommendations for the entrepreneurial community sitting here and out there at large so that they can be the trailblazer of the growth story of India? We need just much bigger volume, right? So I, th I think when, when we describe the examples in the book, you know, we, we, you know, it's at the outside what we say is that we, we want this to be an optimistic narrative about the potential of the India growth story. But where do you get volume from? I, I think, you know, people who are doing very cool things uh, in Bangalore, but, you know, we need many more uh, in, you know, cities and, and people doing, uh, doing uh, entrepreneurial things. And I think the one thing that we really emphasize in the book, and this is something the existing entrepreneurial class, I think, is already doing to, to some extent, but needs to be allowed to do more by governance reforms, actually, is a greater emphasis on collaboration between university research and industry. I mean, there is absolutely no substitute for uh, primary research for example, Yusuf Hamid, who we talked to uh, and, and, and is covered in the book in the CIPLA story, is a, is a remarkable story how he, for example, you know, emerges as a, you know, a leader in, in, in rescuing you know, a large number of people in Africa from AIDS uh, because, of his, because he made the, 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 the medicine cheaply available. He tells us, for example, that he, he has hit a ceiling because going beyond this as a company, as an entrepreneur, as a, as a global leader actually in this, he needs primary research. Hmm. He doesn't have the capital to do it. Hmm. He has the commercial acumen to do it. He has the ability to translate primary research into commercialized products, yeah. but he cannot do the primary research. Yeah. Yeah. And so we can, you know, so one thing we keep emphasizing, uh, what, what I meant was that entrepreneurs should be allowed to do it. I think there are lots of entrepreneurs in India who want to contribute towards uh, endowing chairs, endow endowing money in universities, but this needs to happen on a war footing hmm. uh, where, you know, we just set up, Universe, many more universities like the Indian Institute of Science and also encourage their collaboration with industry to commercialize the products. I see. I think um, uh, you also mentioned in the book something which caught my attention, which was that 
Now, firms and services sector don't really need to scale to succeed. If you could help us understand that bit a little for the reason that most of us here in the audience would appreciate that you know many entrepreneurs succumb to the pressure to scale. And, 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 and if you could help us understand where are you coming from when you say that it's not necessary to scale to succeed. So, um, you know, uh, one of the problems in manufacturing is that scale brings productivity. Oh, oh. You have bigger scale, you become uh, more able to use bigger machines across the process, oh. you become more productive. So that implied that you went for export-led growth oh. because to get the size of demand you needed, you needed to export. Uh, example we give in the book is top hats, right? Let's say you want to manufacture tops, top hats. Well, how many fancy people wear top hats in India? Maybe a couple at the race course, but I don't think there are many and they look odd, right? But there are many across the world who wear top hats uh, in the US, in the UK. So if you were a top hat manufacturer, you would almost surely focus on exports because that would give you scale. Hmm. Now, the point with services, however, is the economies of scale sometimes can be, you know, don't necessarily need to be there. If you have a consultant who's really good, they don't necessarily need five other consultants to be with them. They themselves can produce high quality. A designer on their own can produce high quality. So what is happening to some extent is you don't need to grow over a long period of time to reach the scale which gives you the kind of productivity which gives you global reach. A good consultant, a good designer, a good creative artist can reach the world today just putting their shingle out there and saying, I'm available for the world. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, the example of that is Tilfi, yeah. which is a relatively small outfit, relatively small number of saris, mm. but because to some extent the creativity and that is at the center of Tilfi yeah. is not necessarily something that goes into scale, it can actually sell across the world right off. So I just wonder then why do most of uh, you know, entrepreneurs succumb to this pressure of scale? <laughs> Maybe, yeah. I think because this is the cookie cutter model, right? Mm. That that works. We're not in trying to say scale is not important. Mm. What we're trying to say in the book is for a large subset of services, scale is not essential, especially right at the outset. Mm. So obviously, if you want to make global products, scale is in some sense is important. Um, but because of the nature of 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 products focused on services, uh, you don't always need scale. You can actually, you know, be small for a relatively long period of time and yet be highly profitable. Yeah. You've been doing the rounds around the country, uh, taking your book around different cities, meeting different people. So the question is the following. What is it that you've learned or unlearned during these past few days that you probably wanted to put in the book and you would like your future readers to know? <laughs> <laughs> you, you want to take that? <laughs> no, I would like you to answer too. Okay. If possible. Uh, well, uh, the problem in the environment we're in today is that we are a divided society. And people want to attack what they don't. Do. Yeah, they want to engage with the identity rather than the idea. And so we're going to great pains to say this is not an attack. This is a bunch of ideas, and you should be willing to embrace them also if you care for the nation. Don't care, that's a different issue. Hmm. <laughs> but if you care for the nation, you should be willing to debate this because we're talking about accelerating growth. But to accelerate growth, first you have to see what are we not getting right. If you say everything is fine in this perfect world, and we're the best nation in the world, we're guru to the world, we're, everybody respects us, we have nothing to learn, we don't have place to start the conversation. We have met audiences who believe this, who actually don't want to hear that we have 35% malnutrition. They don't accept that as a number. If we don't even accept the basic facts, we can't have a conversation. And one of the things we're trying to say is you don't have to necessarily dismiss the other side, engage with the idea, and then we can have a proper conversation. You can tell me you're all wrong. We have to go back to the old system. We have to look like China. We will grow strongly. Fine, we can have a debate. But let's accept some basic facts in having that debate. How about you? Did you meet anybody interesting that you want your audience or your future readers to know? No, I think we've yeah we've been meeting a a very uh, you know large class of interesting people. Yeah, I I think I think just taking off from what Raghu said, you know, I think we have a line in the book, uh, and I think we said it a couple of places also that which is a terminology that is 
being used quite actively these days is is the terminology of a vishva guru yeah and you know we sort of say that you know technically speak or literally speaking a vishva guru is someone like kind of who's a net exporter of ideas this is the economist parlance of how they would define and you know we find it interesting at least i can say i find it interesting that you know when we say that actually broadly speaking india is a net importer of ideas mm-hmm. It's, it doesn't mean that we were never, you know, that we, uh, the next line we write in the book is that, you know, we have exported many ideas in spiritualism to the whole world. And, and we describe that in detail in the book. But if you look at it as a proud but rational Indian, as we speak today, we are a net importer of ideas. And the aspiration must be to be a net exporter of ideas. Somehow the word, vi- I don't know, just a challenge for the word Vishwaguru, you know, people get very ex- animated in a certain way instead of. Uh, engaging in a rational way. All right. So last question, a futuristic question to both of you. What does India after 100 years look like to you? Um, yeah. uh, you know, at the Amrit Kal, you, you, you've shown what... 100 years from now or... Uh, no, 100 years or since independence. 100 years since independence. Okay. So at the so end of the Amrit Kal. Before I get there, just one. Because we were not sure we would have a debate instead of a Mama Tutu kind of interaction, we actually have a chapter in the book, chapter 13, which is modeled after the father of the nations uh, in Swaraj, where he has a dialogue between him and a a critic. The reader and the editor. Reader and the editor. And we sort of take the, um, with all due humility, we are the editor and and the guy from the other side is the reader. And we address a whole bunch of issues, obviously in the way we would have a debate with somebody from the other side who is willing to listen. We're assuming they're willing to listen and not saying you're anti-national, you're, uh, you're this and you're that. And I would suggest you read it because it throws some light on some of our current debates. But we didn't want that at the beginning of the book because we wanted, in a sense, to have a, initially, what is our model? What are we thinking about the way forward? What is the role of democracy in our vision? Why do we need to strengthen democracy rather than weaken it? Those were all the cases we made up front in the book because, as uh, Rohit always says, his teacher taught him, you need a model to beat a model. There's a very powerful model at the center today. We need a model to beat that model, to offer an alternative. And we would hope the center would move towards that model, Hmm. but we need that model out there. So what is my hope for the next, uh, you know, Amrit Kal? I hope we become an intellectual property-creating giant. We become a society with extensive debate. We argue with each other all, all the time. Yeah. But we don't uh, essentially point a finger at somebody who criticizes us and says, say, yeah. you're a anti-national. Yeah. We talk about ideas, we debate them. We are the argumentative Indian, but we're not the accusative Indian. That's a lovely uh, place to be. <laughs> You have been listening to BIC Talks by Bangalore International Centre. If you like what you heard, do follow us on social media. Keep up with our programming by signing up for our mailer on the website or leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. The crew that makes these podcasts possible is Gaurav Krishna and Ishan Gupta on sound supervision and production with support from S. Sarona Raj and Raghu Tenkaila. Artwork is designed by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studio. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. This is Lekha Naidu, signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC. Thank you.